paper one consists of macroeconomics and economic pursuits. Um, so macroeconomics is basically term one's work, um, and it has four topics, and then and economic pursuits is um, term three's work. So this, these are the materials that we're going to look at. So starting off with section C, um, they have provided us with past essay questions, and here are some tips and tricks that you need to know and apply um, when answering the questions in the exam. So when it comes to paper one, you can decide or you can specialize in what you are most comfortable with. So whether that be macroeconomics or economic pursuits. If you do decide to answer according to um, macroeconomics in section A, oh, the, the structure of the paper would be, of course, you have uh, six questions. Um, you answer uh, section A, which is question one, and it's compulsory. Then, since you're specializing in section B, out of the three questions, you are only going to answer question two, which uh, focuses only on macroeconomics, and then question four, which has a combination of macroeconomics and uh, economic pursuits. Then section C, which is your essay question, which we will go through now um, during the session. Um, and that is how you will answer it if you specialize using, um, if you specialize studying macroeconomics. Then if you decide to do the economic pursuits, uh, so you will answer question one as well in section A. In section B, you will then answer question three and question four. Question three will be purely on economic pursuits and question four would be your combination of macroeconomics and economic pursuits. Then when it comes to section C, you will answer question six only. And please do not answer more than the required uh, questions. Um, we know that that is an exam rule since grade 10. So the markers will not mark um, questions in access. Um, so I will tell you, please note that your essay is play a very important role in your success in economics because uh, you must only choose one essay to answer in both questions. And we know that that counts for 40 marks out of your 150 marks. So by the mere fact that you are already answering your essay, you are already, um, you're already through the um, for success within the subject economics. So, um, as you know, we make use of the 2021 exam guidelines. And if you don't have access to it, you're most welcome to find that online. Uh, or, or you can even inquire by your teacher regarding that. And that is the guideline that they use um, to set up your question paper. So according to the guidelines, 50 marks will be from one of the selected essays, and 10 marks will be a moderate to difficult high order question that requires you to give a deeper insight and understanding of the particular topic that is being asked. Then the value here to make sure that you study each topic in detail to prepare for your um, exam. So when they say about each topic in detail, they mean if we look at macroeconomics, you need to study circular flow as a topic on its own. You need to study business cycles as a topic on its own. You need to study public sector and foreign sector, foreign exchange market as well as a topic on its own. So that is how you know that you'll master the topic in the exam or the questions in the exam. Then you must prioritize your essay questions from one to six because each topic has about six essay questions where one is most likely and six is unlikely. And then you can also study when you now prepare for your upcoming exam. You study it according to how you have prioritized it. Then they tell you um, essay questions that are not tested in section C might be assessed in section B. Therefore, um, you will have a great advantage if you study all the essay questions because you might have come in. But in section B, that is where you will score your marks once more. 
So let us look at the um, essay question that they gave us yeah, in your booklet. So the first essay question is from the 2023 May-June um, exam. And the first part is discussing detail the markets within the four sector circular flow model. And that is 26 marks. So that is indirectly your 30 marks because as you know you must have introduction which is two marks in your body which is 26 marks and the conclusion which is another two marks that gives you 30 marks so we already uh give you 30 marks so as we know we don't know what the um additional part of it will be but as you study through your work that might be um tested so, and then the second part of that question is how can the increase in injections impact um, the South African economy? So that is how the phase of 40 more questions. So that was in June 2023, May, June. Then um, yeah, the 2022 November rewrite paper. There they are discussing details for um, the reasons for international trade. And as you know, that is a two components, the demand and supply side, and I would advise you in your preparation to uh, study both um, of it um, so that you can get the maximum um, marks out of the question. Then, uh, so that was the rewrite paper, then the, the 2022 paper that also asked you to discuss in detail the features underpinning the forecast of the business cycle. Um, so these are the questions that they asked previously. So now we are going to work through it together as a collective. So on your, in your booklet, there they already gave you the first um, essay. And now we are going to work through the introduction together. And I'm first going to allow you to write your own introduction before I share my introduction with you. And we can compare our notes. So um or our introduction so um as we know whatever we discuss our introduction is normally the topic that we are about to discuss so you are now going to start your essay off with in this essay i am about to discuss the four sector model that is incorrect unfortunately and you're going to lose out on two marks however your introduction will be the definition of the topic that you're about to discuss and the topic that you're about to discuss here is um, the circular flow model. Therefore, your introduction should relate to the definition of the circular flow model. So can you please write down your um, introduction and then you are most welcome to share it in the chat and then we will also give you acknowledgement for that. I'm going to give you about two minutes to write down your introduction and this is also another technique uh, to study as well. Right, uh, I think our two minutes are now over. So is there any school that is willing to share the introduction with us on the chat so that we can um, see if it's correct? Uh, so there's no answer, so I'll just share my introduction quickly. Um, so, as I mentioned prior, that the introduction needs to be the definition of the topic that we're about to discuss. And in this case, we are discussing the circular flow because the four sector model relates to the circular flow. So, the, therefore, your introduction would be the circular flow model is a simplified representation of the interaction between the participants of the economy. So that is what um, a acceptable introduction would be. And therefore, you get your two marks. 
then moving on to the bodies or the main part where you'll score your maximum marks of 26. They asked you in the original question to discuss the four sector. So now when we look at the four sector, we look at um at the goods uh, market, at the factor market, at the financial market, money market, capital market, and the exchange market. So we look at all those elements. So in your essay, you do get marks for your heading, and you're very important in your essay, you must write their body um, so that the marker can know that they are currently marking your body. So um, your goods or product or output market, any one of those would be acceptable. You'll get one mark for that. And then these are the um, market for consumer goods and services. And then they, they just classify what the good is, what the service is, and that is uh, grade 10 knowledge because that's what we've done in the beginning of grade 10. So therefore you all um, should be familiar with it. Then factor market or your resource market or your input market. That is the second one. Then we just give a brief definition of it, what, what it is. So households have a factors of production. Um, and then they just tell us what it all includes. Then your financial market. Um, another mark for indicating that. Um, and just give a definition of what the financial market is. Money market. Um, another mark there. And then um, they tell you what the money market is. So it's a short term loan or, or funds to be saved and borrowed. Um, and then moving on to our capital market. So capital is where we save for long term um, savings and, um, and borrowing of money. And then lastly, our foreign exchange market. So that is how your body should look. So we are just going over this because your educators might have asked you this um, um, in your March and June as well as as well as September. If not, this is one essay that you should be studying as well. Then conclusion. So our conclusion is normally where we summarize everything that we've discussed, but we're not repeating any facts of the body or introduction because it should not be repeating. And we should not also say that I have, in this essay, I have discussed the full sector model, blah, blah, blah. No, it is more a higher order um, response to the topic that you have discussed. And here the suitable or acceptable response that is given in this particular essay is that markets are crucially important institutions in our economic system because they regulate the demand and supply and safeguard price stability and general business confidence. So, um, Greto, this is fairly easy and one, advi uh, one advice that I could also give is um, when it comes to your essays, study your introduction, then your heading, you can uh, make an acronym for yourself, and then you also know how to place it. Sometimes um, it might not be in this order, however, um, we would like it to be in this order, but we know when it comes to the exam, we tend to be nervous, and then we do not write it in the order that it is presented now in front of you, but however, it should be like this. So that's the first essay, and that was from the 2023 um, May, June. And as you can see, we haven't touched on the additional part because there's no guarantee that that will be exactly the same. So we are just focusing on introduction, body, and conclusion here. We could score a maximum of 50 out of 40 marks. Then the paradigm, economic paradigm, and that has to do with. Um, the business cycle. So in your introduction, you would then um, give a brief definition of the business cycle. Then in your main part, you discuss the demand side policies and the supply side policy, um, and then your conclusion. So 
um, I'm just going to briefly go over it. Um, you, sh you all have this information because I need to get to the um, concepts as well. So there, they give you a example of an introduction. Business cycles are successive periods of growth and decline in economic activities. Then the demand side policy, they tell you what it focuses on. Um, and they also tell you, um, speaks to inflation and unemployment. In supply side policy, they do have the reduction of cost, infrastructural administration costs and cash incentives. Um, so that is all in your notes. Then the conclusion here is a good example of a conclusion. So if you don't have it, I would advise you to copy it down while we're going through the session quickly. And of course, if you have any questions, you're most welcome to um, ask it in the chat. So the conclusion of this particular essay, the new economic paradigm encourages economic stability through thoughtful, long-term policy decisions relating to demand and supply. Right. Um, Pepe, you can just indicate if there are any questions. I'm just moving on to the next essay. Um, here they, the third essay is discussing details of features underpinning forecasting of business cycles. So this one relates again to business cycles. Therefore, you have the um, same introduction. Um, regarding business cycles, definition of business cycle. Then when it comes to the body, the body they want us to discuss the features that underpin the forecasting of business cycle. So here we are dealing with the various um, indicators that we look at. Um, so we have done this in grade 10 as well. So you, uh, you should be familiar with it as well. So the first one would be your leading indicator. So you give a broad definition of what the leading indicator is. Um, and there's an example as well of it. Coincidental indicator. They move at the same, they move at the same time as the economy moves and it shows the actual state. Then lagging. So this changes um, direction after the business cycle has changed. Then your um, composite indicator. Then um, extrapolation and then amplitude and then trend as well and length. A good way to that I would advise you to study this is by drawing a business cycle and by the fact that you could draw a business cycle from scratch. Um, that is also another way that you understand um, how these indicators would work. And maybe sometimes, I'm not saying it is going to be, sometimes they would um, ask you that as well as an eight more question or as an additional as well, but just by the mere fact that you would draw a uh, business cycle as well. So that is a, another way for you to understand this particular essay in detail. Then a suitable conclusion would be policy makers um, should closely watch all these indicators because we know for a fact each one plays an important role and the other side because external factors are significant for the South African business cycle. So that is the third essay. Um, then I'll just move on to the first one if there's no question. So far, regarding our essay, question. So the fourth essay says here yeah, discussing detail or discussing details, the reason for public sector failure, and then they tell us in bracket linker to typical 
um, problems experienced through public sector provisioning. So um, it is also very important as we work through this essay that you understand under which topic it falls. Therefore, I, um, I told you previously, you must study topic by topic for your upcoming exam. So once you study um, circular flow, then you will study the concepts which we will go through now, as well as the essays related to it. And please, grade 12, um, the only way to be successful is to study well in advance. You cannot study the day or the hour or the night before um, you're about to write for your exam, because that is how you're going to um, shoot yourself in the foot at the end of the day. So the key success is to prepare well in advance. Therefore, we are going over this. So if there are any other questions related to this, this is now your opportunity to speak up and ask. So the definition would be public sector. So the state plays an important role in regulating economic activity and guiding and shaping um, the economy. So that is the accepted one. Um, then they ask us to discuss the objective. But yeah, the objective. So now we're going to look at economic growth. That is one of the objectives, full employment, a change rate stability, um, price stability, and then equitable distribution of income. So those are the five objectives that the state feature, that the state um, needs to look at. So now we need to discuss each one in detail. Um, so under economic objective, sorry, under economic growth, we're going to tell us how does economic growth take place. It takes place when there's an increase in the production of goods and services, and it's measured by real GDP. As we know, we've got real and we've got nominal GDP. Um, the state also attempts um, to ensure continual improvement in the productive capacity of the economy or country. And then they also give us some stats, but that was in 2021. Of course, you're most welcome to add your recent stats as well. And if you don't know where to find it, um, you can consult Stat SA or you can um, for the most recent real GDP figure if you would like to add it. Then, um, Full employment, by now we know full employment means that everyone um, has a job, um, everyone that's willing and able to work, works. Um, and then the state attempts to curb or reduce unemployment by taking action to ensure that to ensure that all members of the economic active population who would like to work or are able to work. Um, are able to find employment, and this includes your disabled or previously disadvantaged individuals. And then they say currently the unemployment rate is at 27%. But remember, this was at this was in 2021 when this essay was formulated. We know by now that that has increased to over 50%. So you're most welcome to add that as well. Then balance of payment equilibrium. We change rate stability. Um, we know that South Africa is heavily reliant on trading, and therefore, if um, our change rate is stable like it is now currently, then that will lead to a um, favorable outcome for us as South Africa that is heavily reliant on import as well as for other countries that we send our goods and services to. In price stability, so we know for a fact that South Africa is a mixed economy and uh, prices fluctuate as demand and supply changes. And if we do not have price stability, that leads to an unstable economy. And that might lead to us um, not get, getting the full value of our um, currency at the end of the day. Therefore, they, in South Africa, they try to stabilize inflation right by putting a target between 3 and 6%. So, um, as you study um, 
So this, this inflation targeting, for example, that could be a question that they asked in the section B, identify the inflation targeting. Um, in by the mere fact that you just studied the essay, you can already answer a question in section B. Then equitable distribution of income. So in a free economy, there's always fear that the wealthy people will get rich and the poor people will stay poor. Um, and then the only way that the government could control this situation is by creating policy to ensure that um, the distribution of income and wealth is um, safeguarded. And then we know for a fact in South Africa, we have various tax systems. And one of the tax systems is the progressive income tax or your taxes on your profits. Um, and that we use to fund um, state expenditure. So that is just a brief overview of this essay. And then your conclusion, you have to say, despite the fact that um, the state has achieved successes, we know that they were or there are successes that they have achieved, but there are still things or the goals of the state are of the state are hampered by the lack of accountability, corruption, nepotism, and incompetence. Of course, you're most welcome to add your own viewpoint on it, but remember it must make sense at the end of the day. So this is just a acceptable conclusion for this particular essay. The next essay that we are looking at is discuss the reasons for international trade. And like I told you previously, um, there are two particular reasons that they look at here, the demand reasons and the supply reasons. And I've advised you to study both because um, we don't know. Sometimes I ask you just to focus on one or sometimes I ask you just to discuss it. And when you have to discuss it, then Um, once you have to, once you have to discuss both, then you have a fair understanding of it, or they could even ask it as a eight mark question. So, um, before I continue, are there any questions? Well, the land of physics. um, it looks like I skipped one essay here, I think. Um, I'll just go through it quickly, briefly. So the, so this is another public sector essay here. So the, you know, the OSH is discussing detail, the reasons for public sector failure and link it to problems. So, yeah, your introduction B, um, the definition of the public sector. So we know that public sector failure occurs when the government intervention within the economy leads to an inefficient allocation of resources and an overall decline in the economic welfare. So that is an acceptable introduction. Then we need to look at the following under your, under your body. Management failure, bureaucrat, apathy, structural weaknesses, and special interest group, as well as lack of motivation. Politicians, and then your conclusion. So in this essay, we would have about seven headings. So looking at management failure, so basically people that are um, so they have improper qualifications or lack of training or experience in a particular sector, but they um, have to lead the economy. Then corruption exists when the government official to exploit the position for personal gain. And by just looking at our economy, we could 
see that this is all happening. So therefore, I'm 9.2. So elaborate on it. Taking bribes um, for my team fraud, nepotism, behaving dishonest, um, being bureaucrat. So it's basically a government official that tend to be more interested in obeying the rule than efficient delivery of goods and services. Um, then apathy. Um, yeah, we look at when there's a lack of motivation or a never mind attitude to what's going on around you. And um, just going through this particular essay, we can clearly see that this, we are good examples of this within our um, economy, um, whether it be local or national. The intellectual weaknesses. Um, so structural objectives are not met. So we sp spoke pro previously about one of the objectives and that was full employment. So that is an objective that the government has said that they do not meet it. Um, and then special interest groups. So you either speak about your trade unions or your people that can influence government. Um, and then lack of motivation. So your workers, um, they receive, they don't receive any form of incentives for the jobs that they do, and that may, may lead to a lack of motivation for them. And then at the end of the day, um, they do not do this, they do not fulfill the task that they're supposed to fulfill. Then politicians, we know that we had an election this year, and, uh, and here they say that politicians tend to promote policies and spend money on projects to get votes in return at the end of the day. So that is what this essay looks at. And then your conclusion, South Africa requires a creative and competitive private sector with new technolo technological or technologies um, that can help entrepreneurs to enter industries where the state um, dominates. Then public um, reasons for international trade and uh, acceptable introduction would be the definition of international trade, which is the exchange of goods and services between countries. Then looking at our demand reasons, we must first assess the size of the population and um, as we know for a fact, if the population is high, then the demand rate will also be high at the end of the day. Um, and if they cannot, if they're in a position where they are unable to um, have enough food and services, then they are forced to import, and that leads or that gives reason for international trade at the end of the day. Income level, so changes in income level will, will Reflect in your demand as well. So, of course, the more you earn, the more you might demand. Um, and that may lead to an increase in um, international trade. Then changes in the wealth of the population. So, if everyone works at the end of the day and everyone receives an income, that might that could all lead to a, an increase in the wealth for the population. Um, and at the end of the day, um, they will be more, more goods and services. Um, people have um, access to loans and they'll purchase bigger and more luxurious goods. And if the country cannot produce these goods, it must be imported. Um, and then your preference and taste. So as we know, in general, um, if you uh, want something, then of course, um, you need to pay for it. So if your preference is high, then at the end of the day, that might lead to a high um, international, um, high international um, reliance because of your preference and taste. And here they give an example. Um, customers in Australia prefer a product and they do not produce it, they put it into imported, and then that's gonna lead to a higher value than in other countries. And just looking at our country specifically, a good example would be um, the latest iPhone. 
So it's currently 16 and um, in our economy, that would be like 40 plus thousand, but in a different economy, that is maybe 20 or 30,000, the latest I saw. And that leads to demand um, and therefore international trade. And then lastly, under demand season, uh, consumption patterns. So of course, if people would um, spend, okay, so this is firstly determined by the level of economic development of a country, so if a country is rich, this means that they are in a position to con to spend more, and then that also leads to an increase in, the, in international trade. And then poorly developed countries will have a high demand for basic goods and services, but a low demand for luxury goods. So that is all under um, your demand reasons. And remember, demand comes from us. Then supply reasons. So the first one is your natural resources. So we know for the fact that everyone, if the country has access to natural resources, and it will vary from country to country, and in the world use countries that have or that are rich in natural resources, they might come and exploit those particular countries like the area, for example, South Africa's gold and diamond resources that have given us an advantage in producing um, gold and diamonds in climatic conditions. Um, and Lately, we have been experiencing this um, across our country. Um, we have experienced it, but other countries are also experiencing it. And a good example of this uh, would be that in the news, they said that um, as a matter of, because of the climatic conditions in wherever they're producing the potatoes, that might lead to a supply problem. And at the end of the day, we might have to pay more for um, certain crops at the end of the day. Yeah, the same many crops can only be cultivated in certain climatic conditions and areas and in certain kinds of soil. So by the mere fact that we uh, couldn't maintain that soil or with all that climate, climatic condition, at the end of the day, that now leads to a supply reason for us. So at the end of the day, we might be forced to import potatoes and if we import potatoes, there are many other factors that we need to consider the change rate, um, as well as the demand as well. But um, that is your climatic conditions. Then labor resources, we know for a fact in certain countries, they demand skilled labor, but um, unfortunately they do not have enough people within that population and therefore they need to import people maybe um, and then this enables them to produce goods and services at a lower cost um, then they're supposed to this enables them to produce goods and services at a lower price um, and they are produced in other countries and in technological resources um, we know for a fact that our first world countries have more access to technological resources than our third world countries. Um, and of course, that also impacts us on the supply. Then specialization, we know that some countries are good in producing certain goods and services. And by the mere fact that they are now in that position, they can now go have complete um, Comparative advantage over the rest of the world. In capital, we know for a fact in certain countries, capital, and when we speak about capital, we're speaking about equipment. We're not speaking about money. We're speaking about the equipment. Cannot be obtained easily, and therefore, due to a lack of capital, they are, are unable to produce goods and services, and then they, um, may have to import that as well, which leads to um, an increase in goods and services. Then an acceptable conclusion here would be um, the need, sorry, the need for integration will never be absolute because nations of the world need each other to survive with um, developmental purposes. So 
Um, those are the essays under macroeconomics. We're going to go over um, Growing Pursuits essays later on, and then we'll also go over paper two, if time allows. So now in your booklet, um, there are um, concepts given to you and sorry, descriptions given to you, and we just want in return the concepts. And, uh, want to encourage you to please put it in the chat. Um, but I first want to give you a few minutes to answer it on your own and then teachers, please um, put the learners responses in the chat so that you can acknowledge them. Um, you can acknowledge them and also guide them through it. And this is one way that um, you need to practice because concepts are asked in section A. And once you know and understand your concepts, you will walk in there confidently to answer section A as well as section B. And as you saw now, with the essay questions in section C as well, by introduction, we need the definition of the topic. So here are about, um, I think, over 40 concepts. 56 concepts. So we are going to give you five at a time um, to ensure that you um, know the concept because in looking at section A alone or question 1.3, that is only poorly answered because of um, the lack of studying your concepts, I would say. So I'm going to give you about two minutes to do this first five and you will compare our answers. Right. Are there any um, answers for the first five um, concepts so that we can um, acknowledge your, um, so that we can acknowledge you learners for answering? Right. So I'll read through the first one. Um, so the first description they give you here is a continuous flow of spending, production, and income between different sectors. So what would that concept be? Um, if I get no response, unfortunately, I will not share my answer because um, I would like everyone to answer this particular um, section of the world, the concept. Right, so um, the first one would, of course, be our circular flow model. Then, and it an economy that trades with the foreign sector, an economy that has no foreign sector as a participant. So these two are similar. So could you get a response for that, please? If not, I'm going to ask um, the schools on the chat for the um, response. I believe that Bauhaus does not have any sound uh, according to the chat. So, um, would anyone please advise about how to go about that? Right, so um, an economy that trades with the foreign sector. So, that would be an open economy because we have all four um, sectors within the model. Then, an economy that has no foreign sector as a participant, and that would be a closed economy, and of course, that will only consist of households, businesses, and the government, whereas by number two, they would consist of foreign sector, households, businesses, and government. The sector that does not need to be, sorry, the sector that needs to be included for the economy to be regarded as an open economy, and um, if you Look nicely or get your answer by number two, and of course, that would be your foreign sector. So, then the primary participant, participants, and owners of the factors of production. And um, according to our knowledge, who are the owners of the factors of production and what are they? A circular flow model cannot exist, and that of course would be our household for our consumers as well.
Then moving on to number six. So 10. Um, number six, those financial institutions that are not directly involved in the production of goods and services, for example, your banks, your insurance companies, your pension funds, and the JSE, and that is known as your, um, I see a, a response from Mitando, that is Open Economy, thank you, and then Households as well. Thank you so much for the response. Um, so does anyone have a response for um, number six, seven, eight, nine, and 10? I'll just give you a minute or two to work through it. Right, thank you, Paul. I see your answer. So you say financial sector, and that is for number six. Um, and then as well as Ntan Tokazi. Um, then for number seven, a place or mechanism through which the buyers and sellers need to do business, and that is a market. Thank you to Bauer again for your answer. Right, number eight, a market where factors of production are traded, for example, the labor market. Um, we have an answer then at the resource market, that's correct. Alternatively, you could also say our factor market or our input market. Then number nine, um, the market where fact, a market where goods and services are traded, for example, cars or milk, and that would be your goods market. Thank you so much. And then number 10, the market where both short-term and long-term financial assets are traded. And that is our financial market. Now we're going on to the next five. I prefer doing five at a time. And thank you to the schools for answering so swiftly on the chat. Right, number 11, the short-term and very short-term market for savings and loans. And that is the money market, well done. Um, number 12, long-term funds are borrowed and saved by consumers and business enterprises. And that is our capital market, well done to Baha. Moving on to number 14, I think they skipped number 13 here. Um, a flow of goods and services between the participants in the circular flow model. So we know for a fact we've got two flows. Um, and that is the real flow. Then the flow of income and expenditure between the participants, and that would be the money flow. Then 16, 17, 18, and 20, they skipped 19 days, so I'll move on to 21. So for number 16, money was drawn from the circular flow. Number 17, the inflow of additional money. So the two is linked, they form the reading it together, and they are also included there um, through savings, taxes, and imports. And number 16, and number 17, they were got investment, government expenditure, and payment for exports. So for number 16, when we withdraw money, what do we call that? From the economy or circular flow? And leakage, and that's correct. And an inflow of additional money into the economy would be an injection. Thank you. Then, number 18, the economy is in equilibrium if the leakages are equal to injection. So, what do we call that? The economy is in equilibrium. If your leakages are equal to your injection, 
Right, so that would be your economic equilibrium. Then number 20, the proportion of additional income that household choose to spend on goods and services. So what do we call that? Or what is that terminology? Known as. Right, number 20, we all have marginal propensity to consume. Then number 21, a small initial increase in spending produces a proportionally larger increase in the aggregate national income. And a hint starts with M, with the letter N. So that is a hint. Thank you so much, the multiplier. Moving on to number 22 and 27. A minimum level of consumption um, that takes place even if the income, even if the consumer has no disposable income. And this is a term that most learners um, do not um, remember that well. They thought it's very important for us to go over this one. A minimum level of consumption that takes place even if the consumer has no disposable income. And that is, of course, known as your autonomous consumption. So number 22, please um, go and study that one in detail because that is one concept that learners tend to not answer if, you, if we give it in a 1.3 question. Then, well, um, number 24, which is very easy, income that is not consumed. What do we call that? Income that is not consumed. Right, maybe I'm going to simplify that. So um, you get a 50 rand from your parents or relatives and you only spend uh, 10 rand and what will happen to that 40 rand? We do not consume it. So what do we do with it? We put it in our. So oh, it seems like everyone consumes the income because the worker gives the answer. So it is savings. Number 24 is savings. Then the total value number 25 of all final goods and services produced in the borders of a country for a specific period. And this is one of um, those terminologies that we've been emphasizing since grade 10 as well. Right, no answer. So I guess I want to share mine. Um, so that is known as your gross domestic product. Number 25 is gross, dom gross domestic product. Number 26, the total value of all final goods and services produced by permanent citizens of a country for a specific period. So number 25 and 6 sounds the same, but they are not because number 25, we look at what's in the borders of a country and then here we look at um, by permanent citizens of a country. So, um, number 25, we say that is GDP or gross domestic product, and 26 would be your gross national product. Thank you, Bao. Then, number 27, prescribed by the United Nations to compile the gross domestic product figure. And that would be number 27, which is prescribed by the United Nations to compile the gross domestic product figure. What do we call that particular terminology? Right, no answer so far. And that is known as your system. Thank you. System of national accounts. 
number 28, the increase in the economy's capacity to produce more goods and services. So I would highlight here, increase economy's capacity to produce. That leads to like about, um, number 28, increase in the economy's capacity to produce more goods and services. What do we call that particular term? Right, um, and that is known as your economic growth. Number 28 is known as your economic growth. Then I just want to, um, Remind the learners when it comes to, to um, giving us the terminology. In the exam, it is very important that you do not write any acronyms. We want the full um, term. So you cannot, unfortunately, abbreviate it or give us the acronym of it um, because that is where learners tend to lose out on marks. Then, number 29. Um, it is the base here, and that comes from dark Thai. Thank you so much. Um, and that refers to a specific year used as a benchmark for comparison in various economic analysis. And they like to ask this particular um, concept or, or good. They like to ask this under section B, we will maybe give you a uh, extract or um, figures or a table, and then they would ask you to maybe identify the base here in the extract above, or they could even ask you to give a definition of the base here. Then, number 30, the total spending added together of the four major sectors of the economy, and, the and that is C plus G plus I plus your um, X minus M, what to recall that, so number 30, 31, and 32 uh, relates to calculating our gross domestic product. So there are three methods. So that is my clue to you. So there are three methods to calculate it. So now by number 30 will tell us by this particular, using this particular method, which is consists of your C plus G plus I plus X minus M, what do we call that as? Or what is that known as, that particular message? So that is known as your expenditure method. Thank you so much. Um, then the second, or number 31, if we add all our income earned by our factors of production, what method are we relating or refer sorry, referring to here? So we already identified that number 30 would be our expenditure method. Number 31, we add all our income. That is the keyword. So what method are we using here? Um, that we earn by um, the owners of production. Sorry, the owners of the factors of production. And number 31, income method. Thank you, Bao Um, And then the last method is the adding of the final values of all goods and services calculated as um, gross national, sorry, gross value added. So, so far we have our expenditure method, income method, and then the last one also relates to a method. So what method are we referring to here? And there's only three methods that we can calculate our GDP. Right, so there's no answer so far. So I guess I have to share mine. And that is known as the production method. And um, that is one way of remembering the three different methods that you have. So I'm just going to recap. So when we speak about um, C plus G plus I plus um, X minus M, we relate that to our expenditure method in calculating our GDP. When we look at the income earned, that is our um, income method. And then lastly, if we add all the final values of our goods and services in order to get our gross value added, 
that is known as our production method. Moving on. We are almost done with um, the first part of it. Um, so number 35 is the cost to the producer, adding taxes on production and subtracting subsidies on production. So what do we determine when we do this? We add taxes and we subtract um, subsidies on production. So what do we get at the end of the day? Uh, CM Tanda, are you on, please? Because um, the RFI has been saying that they're um, struggling with this child. So could you kindly advise how to go about that, please? Thank you. Uh, we've got the for number 35, basic prices, and you're correct. Then uh, spending by the population, what do we call that? Right, spending by the population. What do we call um, that? Right, that will be known as your consumption uh, spending. Then goods used as input to produce other goods and services. Goods used as inputs to produce other goods and services. So what do we call that? Right, that is known as your capital goods. Then, number 38, the cost or price paid for the factors of production. Um, and then, then mention the factors of production, land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship, and that is used um, by firms. What do we call that? The cost paid or the price paid for the use of factors of production. So another way of thinking about this particular concept, um, you offer up your labor and what you get in return, uh, you get an income. But now labor is classified as your factors of production. Therefore, your answer should be factor cost or factor price or factor income. So that is the um, accepted terminology by number 38. Then number 39, spending by firms on capital goods. And like I've mentioned previously, capital goods would be your equipment that you use to produce goods and services. So by the mere fact that we as a firm um, would um, spend on that, what do we, what would the firm classify that as for them? Um, and since there's no answer, I'll share mine, and that is investment. Then 40 until 45, I'm going to give you about two minutes to do that, and that will also give um, the RI an opportunity to rejoin the meeting again. Um, so could you please complete 40 to 45 um, in your book and share it um, on the chat so that you can um, acknowledge your answer, please. Right, uh, number 40, prices actually paid by the consumer for goods and services plus all taxes minus any subsidies. So what do we, what is that known as? Prices actually paid by consumers for goods and services plus all taxes less Subsidies, what do we call that? Um, this is known as your market price. Then number 41, net indicators that um, some amount has been taken away. For example, net export reflects the value of export less import. Um, I don't see any answer yet, but I'll share mine and that will be net figure. In economic goods, which do not take a tangible and storable form, what do we call that? An economic good that does not take a tangible or storable form, 
And a good example of this would be when you go to the hair salon, right? Um, then what do you get in return? So you go there, of course, you want to go and do your hair, and then they offer you this particular um, service. So, or you go to the dentist, or you go to the doctor. So there is no tangible uh, way to measure it, or storable way to measure it, and that we call a service. Then, the first subsidies that are not linked to a specific good or service, for example, subsidy made on employment. And the answer is basically in this particular description. Right, and here is your answer. The first subsidy, there is the answer within the description. So as you could see, sometimes when we read the stuff, we will get our answer through it. So it is subsidy, the terminology. Then number 44, financial incentives to help struggling industries produce um, to encourage exports, what do we call that? Subsidy as well, but this is known as subsidies on production because at the end of the day, we want the business to produce. Then a compulsory payment made by private individuals or businesses to the government with no direct benefit. And all of us have to pay it, whether we buy a good or a service, whether we are working, um, we all are responsible for paying this particular um, payment. Some of us pay it indirectly, and some of us pay it both directly and indirectly. What do we call that? Uh, a tax, thank you. Oh. Right, so it's taxes. And then number 47, taxes imposed by the government on goods. Taxes imposed by governments on the production process itself rather than on the sale of goods and services. So this is where you produce something and then the government taxes you for producing that. And that is known as taxes on production. That's number 47. Then number 50, I see that we are skipping a few numbers here. So I do apologize for that. Um, number 50, taxes are levied on the price of the product and ultimately borne by consumers. So a good example of this would be that. So at the end of the day, we have to pay that. And that is known as taxes on product, whereas 47 was taxes on production. So be mindful of that. Both look similar, but there's two different meanings. Then number 51, the processing of natural resources into finished goods. What do we call that? The processing of natural goods into finished goods. What do we call that? Um, that is known as manufacturing. So um, number 52, money paid by the government to a person or financial institution without any counter performance. That is known as your transfer payment. Um, then the process of adding new assets such as machinery and equipment to do, to do, sorry, the process of adding new assets such as machinery and equipment to the existing stock. What do we call that? I told you earlier on, we classify that as capital, so that is already a hint. So if we're just adding more machinery to our existing um, machinery, what do we what is it classified as? I already said a portion of the answer is capital. 
cell number 53, that is known as capital formation. Right. Then number 54 represents the depreciation in the value of its assets over time due to wear and tear. And this is known as consumption of fixed capital. Consumption of fixed capital. Then, second loss, goods and services produced locally and then sold for consumption outside the borders of the country. So, for example, we produce wine in our country and then we send it abroad. And what do we call that that we do? What is that terminology? Export, thank you. Um, and then the last one, goods and services produced in other countries and purchased by local for, firms uh, or households. The opposite of 45's answer. And that would be your import. Right, so now we have officially completed the first topic under macroeconomics, which is circular flow. So now we're moving on to business cycle. So um, here we have more concepts and there's about 30 concepts. And the only way that we could move swiftly through it is if you give your answers in the chat. So thank you to the schools that have been doing that so far. I'm going to give you about three minutes to do um, the number one and do number nine quickly, and then we're going to compare our answers as well. Right, so the first description that they give us here by number one, a period where there is a general increase in economic activity. And that would be an upswing. Then number two measures the distance of the distance between the peak, which is the highest point, and the trap, which is the lowest point of each business cycle. Phase. What do we call that? Number two, we measure the distance between the peak, which is the highest point, and the trap of each business cycle phase. Right, thank you. I'm receiving your answers. Um, I suspect that there might be a delay. I don't know if it's from my side. Um, so number one is an upswing or expansion. That's correct. Thank you. Um, and then number two is that an amplitude. You're correct. Number three. No, sorry. Number four. I see the script number three here. Moving averages are used to. Analyze the changes in the series of data over a certain period of time. That's moving averages. Thank you. Number five, economic activity at its lowest or the deepening of recession. Depression. Thank you. Number six, assesses the performance of the economy. And we worked through this previously when we were working through the essay. So assesses the performance of the economy. And we spoke about the various types that we have. Leading, lagging, coincidental. What do we call that? Um, and that will be an economic indicator. Then number eight. Uh, estimating or forecasting something that is unknown from facts and information that are known. And that is known as extrapolation. Number nine, holds the view, holds the view that markets are inherently unstable, therefore government um, intervention is required. And number, number nine and 10 goes hand in hand because the one um, believes that the Government intervention is required. And number 10 says that believes that markets are inherently stable. The equilibrium may, uh, is caused by incorrect use of policies, for example, monetary policy. Right. Thank you so much. I'm getting the responses um, from the R. Number nine is endogenous. 
for um, a lesion approach. And then number 10 is exogenous, or you could even say the monotonous approach. Then number 11. Uh, a policy that uses tax and government spending, which is implemented by National Treasury, and the aim is to increase or decrease aggregate demand to achieve the macroeconomic objective of full employment and price level stability. A policy that uses tax and government spending. And that is your fiscal policy. Thank you so much. Right. Number 12, 13, 14, and 15 relates to various cycles. So um, you're most welcome to share yours first before I share and go through mine. So the first one is number 12 says loss from 7 to 11 years, so that is your key word when you study. The other one, the number 13 is three to five years. Number 14 is longer than 50 years. And then number 15 is 15 to 20 years. So that is one way of um, studying for the particular cycle. Right. Um, number 12, um, that is known as your juggler cycle. And that's correct. Bye. Thank you. Then number 13, um, three to five years, and that is known as your kitchen cycle. And number 14, longer than 50 years. Um, and that is your conjunctive cycle. And then number 15 um, is your cases plus um, cycle. Then number 16. I'm moving very swiftly because of, the, of your responses. Thank you so much. Uh, give consumers, businesses, and the state a glimpse of the direction in which the economy might be heading. For example, the leading leading of sorry, leading indicator jobs is to advertise um or job at advertising space inventory and sales. So um the answer is indirectly given in the concept already and that is leading indicator. Then number 17. Um, is measured from peak to peak or from trap to trap. Longer cycle shows strength and shorter cycle shows a weakness within um, the economy and that is known as lean. Thank you so much. Then policies used by the monetary authority to change the quantity of money in circulation as well as the interest rate. And we last week and Thursday, there was a meeting out regarding this. Um, the aim is to stabilize prices, reach full employment, and achieve high economic growth. And what policy do they make use of? So we said previously by number 11, that was the fiscal policy, and this one is opposite of fiscal policy. The monetary policy. Thank you. Then, the period immediately before and through the upper turning point of the cycle, before we reach our peak, we will get our boom, and that's correct, thank you. Then number 20, the period where there is a general increase in economic activity, similar to what we had previously, in one of our descriptions, and that is your upswing. Then, number 
21 illustrates the relationship between unemployment and inflation. It's a, it's a type of curve, that is my clue, illustrates the relationship between unemployment and inflation. Um, no, it's not the Laffer curve, it's the Phillips curve. Um, then 2020, 2020, number 22, um, the point where the economic expansion is at its highest. That is known as your peak. Then this common one that they like to ask, negative economic growth for at least two consecutive quarters. And that is classified as a negative growth for two economic quarters, classified as a recession. Then um, it is a grouping of various indicators of the same type into a single value. And then that single value forms the norm for a country's economic performance. And that is your com composite indicator. Then successive periods of growth and decline in um, economic activity. That is known as your business cycles, number 25 business cycle. Then moving at the same time as the economy, and that shows the actual state of the economy. That is your coincidental indicator. It won't change number 27, won't change the direction after the business cycle has changed its direction. Examples of these indicators are hours work in the construction and the total of commercial vehicles sold. And that is lagging um, indicators. Number 28, um, the general direction of the economy. This rising line indicates a growing economy. So we didn't really give you a clue. And the clue in this definition is the rising line. That is one. And then the general direction is the other one as well. Right, then number 29, um, oh sorry, I think it's 28 yet, um, that is known as your trend line. Then number 29, um, the period immediately before and through uh, the lower turning point, and that is known as your slump. Um, and then lastly, the point where the economic contraction is at its lowest, and that is your trust. So that is business cycle um, done and dusted. And when it comes to studying, this is one technique that you could use to study and then you understand the topic much better. Um, then the third subtopic is known as your public sector. So I'm going to give you about three minutes to complete the first thing. Right, so we are ready to compare our answers. So the first one, the government is required to make and implement policies, and then the TELAS public servants are required to explain their decisions and actions. What do we call that? Right, accountability, and you're correct. Number two, a document that details expected revenue and projected expenditure, and that is a budget, and you're correct in that. Number three, an indirect tax um, on goods and services consumed in the economy, and that is known as value added tax. Remember, when it comes to terminology, we know that it is that, but we have to write it out as value added tax because we do not accept abbreviations. 
um, unless the question would stipulate provide the abbreviation for a particular concept. Then an official in a government department, and that is a bureaucrat, then removing or the removal of and it's three restrictions by law, and that is the regulation. Then, number six, taxes that are not shifted to the end user, for example, pay as you earn, and that is known as direct taxes. Um, number seven, public servants provide the public with goods and services promptly and in a desired quantity and quality. What do we call that? Efficient uh, provisioning, efficient provisioning. Then number eight, everyone can use these, whether they are prepared to pay for it or not. For example, the police station. So there's no charge to it. What do we call that? Everyone can use this, whether they are prepared for whether they are to whether they are prepared to pay for it or not. For example, police station. And that is known as a community group. Well done. Thank you. Now can you repeat number seven? We'll do so. Number seven is efficient provisioning. Then number nine. Taxes leave it on the sale of goods and services. And um, number two was number three, I think we mentioned it, but um, now they just want to know what type of tax is it? It's opposite of direct, that's your indirect taxes. Then um, number 10, goods provided for society as a whole, for example. Parks and public utilities, the provision of these goods give rise to free rider problems, and the answer that is received is collective goods, and you're correct. Number 11 shows the relationship between tax rate and income tax, and that is your uh, raffle curve. Number 12, government statement setting out its three year budget and that is known as your medium term budget policy statement and number 13 a document that sets up the expected expenditure and income over a three-year period and that is known as your medium term expenditure framework so number um, 12 relates to the statement that's so medium term policy statement and number 13 as to do with your medium term expenditure um, framework. So the one deals with the expected budget and the other one deals with the expected expenditure over the three year period. Number 14, good and services uh, whose provision has uh, benefits for the user private and for the society, for example, education. Uh, repeat number four, I'll go back to number four quickly. Sorry, quickly. Uh, number four, a bureaucrat. Um, number 14, we are by number 14. Um, any answer for number 14? Good and services whose provision has benefits for the um, private and society, for example, education. What do we call that? And that will be known as your merit goods. Then, number 15, decide on the country's monetary policy and the, um, this took place last week and Thursday where this particular committee had to decide on the state of the economy and therefore make a decision. What do we call that?
and that is known as your monetary policy committee, number 15. Number 16, concerned with national issues, for example, safety and security. Who is responsible for that? Thank you. I'm receiving number 11's answer. I don't know if it is um, due to a internet problem, but uh, we are now by number 16. Thank you so much for those schools. You are both on. Um, number 11 is Leffer. Right, number 16, concerned with national issues, for example, safety and security. So who is responsible? For national issues. On being a local or provincial government, therefore it is national government. Then number 17, the transfer of functions and ownership of entities from private, from the private sector to the public sector. It is known as your or known as. Thank you. Number 16 received national government. Um, number 17, when we transfer functions of and ownership of the private sector to the public sector, that is nationalization that takes place. Then number 18 um, is the opposite of number 14, and this is it is harmful to the community, for example, cigarettes. And that is known as your demerit goods, number 18. Then number 19, public servants fail to deliver services to the public because of uh, bureaucracy, incompetence, and corruption. And Thus, is known as inefficient provisioning. Number 19, inefficient provisioning. Number 20, provided by the state for the provided by the state for the use by all members of society, for example, public library. So that is known as public goods and services, number 20. Then number 21 deals with local issues within a town or municipal area, for example, electricity, delivery, libraries, traffic control, and uh, refuse removal. So the, there's a keyword, and that keyword is local. Therefore, that would be your local government. Moving on. I'm going to give you about three minutes to read through 22, um, 22 until 31 and compile your answers and, of course, share it in the chat, please. Right, we have received answers so far. Thank you uh, so much. Let's quickly compare. So, number 22. I keep on saying 2020, I apologize. Number 22 refers to uh, the transfer of functions and ownership from um, public sector to the private sector, and that is privatization all well done. So, uh, doubt that. Um, then, number 23 um, ensure a more equal distribution of income, higher income. Groups pay more taxes and lower income groups, and that is known as your provisional, sorry, not provisional, progressive tax, um, progressive income tax system. Then, uh, thank you to Dr. Dai, and then we stand up, I don't know from what, which school you are, but thank you. Um, then, number 24, concerned with the administration of, um, Nine provinces and economic issues found 
economic issues specific to a region, um, and that is known as your provincial or regional government. Then number 25, causes an unequal distribution of income. Lower income groups pay more taxes than higher income groups, and that is known as your is known as your regressive tax system, number 25. Number 26, uh, putting laws into place to regulate activities, and that is regulation. Um, number 27, a business owned um, only or partly by the state and run by a public authority, for example, ESCOM and SAA, um, that is known as your state-owned enterprises. Thank you so much. In time, look, as I see number 25, it's correct, the regressive tax system. Then number 28 deals with economic and other issues specific to a region or province. That is your regional government. Then number 29, consultation with commercial banks to act in a desirable manner. And a good tip here would be that um, this falls under the monetary policy. Um, so this is one method that they could use. Um, was in the economy, and that is known as moral suasion or persuasion. Um, then number 30, when resources are allocated in such a way that no one can be made better off without better off without making someone else worse off, and that is known as your Pareto efficiency. Then Number 31, when an organization or a country is released from its obligation to pay, repay a loan, and that is known as debt forgiveness. And I saw that the authors in previous papers, so please do not disregard in studying this terminology, debt forgiveness. And then last term under public sector is the expenditure of the expenditure of the government sector, and that is known as government spending. So now, so far, we have completed three topics, and now we're moving on to the final one, which is foreign sector. So I'm going to give you about three minutes to um, record your responses on the page, as well as to send it through, and then we will compare um, before we move on to economic pursuits. That I see there's a request for uh, number 29 under 31 answers. So I'll just repeat quickly under public sector. So 29 is moral uh, suasion or persuasion. Number 30 is Pareto efficiency. Number 31 is debt forgiveness. Right, I think we are ready to compare our answers now. So number one, under foreign exchange markets, where one country can produce goods or services uh, cheaper than another, and that is known as your absolute advantage. Then number two, a country's currency is an increase in the price of the currency in terms of another due to market forces. And that's, a, that's appreciation, I see your answer, that's correct. Um, number three, systematic record of all transactions between one country and other countries, for example, South Africa, between South Africa and all other countries in the world. And that is known as your balance of payments, yes. Number four, um, internationally, are international transactions related to ownership of fixed assets, uh, transfer of funds, and then I see here's an answer, but I can't make it out. Um, 
and that is known as your capital transfer account because we deal with fixed assets there. Day number five, a situation where one country, situation where one country has a relative a relative advantage in the production of goods and services, and that is your competitive advantage. Well done. Uh, then number six, because international transactions relating to production income and expenditure, and that takes place under your current account. Then uh, depreciation. Oops. Um, number seven is a decrease in the price of the currency in terms of another country's currency due to market forces. So that is similar to number two. However, uh, number two we had an increase, and number seven we have a decrease. And a decrease leads to a depreciation. Then, uh, number eight, a deliberate or the deliberate decrease in the value of the rand um, in terms of another currency, and that is devaluation. So, the key word is deliberate when, in, when we deal with number eight. Then, I'm going to Give you another few minutes to do nine until seventeen. Right, let's compare number nine. Um, includes transactions relating to investments, example investments in businesses, and that is direct investment. I do see other answers. Um. Then there's someone that also wants the nine answer. I'll just repeat quickly again the answers before we move on to number 10. Number one, uh, we said that that was absolute advantage. Number two, that was appreciation. Number three, balance of payment. Number four is capital transfer account. Number five is competitive advantage. Uh, number six is current account. Number seven, depreciation. Number eight, Devaluation. So that is what we've done so far, and we continue now with number nine. So number nine, that is direct investment. Number ten, uh, the the rate at which one country, the rate at which one currency is exchanged for another. It is also considered the value of one country's currency in terms of another country's currency, and that is known as your exchange rate. Number 11, international investment transactions by South Africa and other countries and foreigners in South Africa. So this relates to your balance of payment. So under what account do we classify this? And this would take place in your financial account, number 11. Number 12, an investment made in a specific asset worth a fixed future payment, fixed future payout value for a specific date, and that is your financial derivative. Number 13 is, oh, sorry, determine the relative values of different currency and enable the conversion of currency to facilitate international trade. And what do we call that? Um, number 13 would be your foreign exchange market. Number 14. 
currencies are devalued and revalued. And that takes place when we make use of the fixed exchange rate system. So it's fixed exchange rate. Number 15, the value of the currency is determined purely by the forces of the market, i.e. demand for the rand and supply of rand, and that is your free floating exchange rate. It is free floating because we rely on demand and supply. Then number 16, when consumers and producers are free to buy goods and services anywhere in the world without any restriction. Free trade, thank you. And uh, this is the previous answer and from um from Bardell High. Thank you so much. I do see 14 and 15 from from Bardell High. Then number 16 is free trade, like I've mentioned before. Or well, if I didn't mention it, I mentioned it now. Um number 17 an international uh, organization that lends money to countries with ongoing balance of payments problem, an international organization that's your keyword. Um, so I am if um, you are correct, but remember I've mentioned previously not to um, populate any abbreviations. We want the full term. So the IMF is correct, but also incorrect. We want you to give the full um, term out, and that is International Monetary Fund. Then number 18, exchange of goods and services across the border. And that is international trade, well done. Number 19, these are these are exchange rates which are allowed to respond to market forces within certain limits. Thank you so much, Fardell I, for number 17 answer, as well as um, I. Number 18, yes, at uh, international trade, we now preserve number 19. Exchange rates which are allowed to respond the market forces within certain limits. What do we call that particular term? Manage exchange rate. Thank you so much for I. For the um, border I. Um, then number 20, money that enters a country is offset against money that leaves the country. And that is known as your net balance. Then 22 until 29, I will just give you a few minutes to. Um, write down your answers. No, uh, number 22, buying of financial assets such as shares on the stock exchange of another country. What do we call that? That would be, of course, your portfolio investment. Then number 23, financial capital held by the monetary authority such as the central bank or IMF to finance uh, trade imbalances. And that would be your reserve asset, number 23. Then number 24 refers to a deliberate increase in the value of the currency in terms of another. And that would be your revaluation because we deliberately increasing the value of the currency. Number 25, a financing instrument distributed among members, among member countries of the IMF. Um, and this is known as special drawing right. So I, that is a, um, when I look through past papers, I saw that as well as a common um, um, that they would like to ask as well. So therefore, must be prepared for everything. Um, number 26, um, 
compare a country's export prices with um, its import prices by means of index, and that is known as terms of trade. Then the value of your exports minus your imports, that is known as your trade balance. Then number 28, money received without any productive services rendered, for example, gift, um, that is known as your transfer payment. Number 29, an item in the balance of payment that caters for any omissions, mistakes, and errors in the balance of payments. Um, that is classified as your unrecorded transaction. In the last two, the final two, under uh, foreign exchange market, number 30, the market in which one currency can be traded for another, example, and for the dollar, and that is your foreign exchange market. And in the last one, Thank you. Number 29, I see and recorded transaction. The last one, um, the change rate is set by um, market forces. And then speak about market forces, they're referring to demand and supply with central bank intervention. And that is known as your managed or your control floating. So now, so far, we have done all four. Um, topics under macroeconomics. Now we're just going to move to the essays quickly um, so that you can, essays of under economic pursuit so that you can know what essays um, have been asked previously and also how to prepare for it and then move back to the uh, terminology. So can you all go to page 17 in your booklets, please? So on page 17, we all find your uh, economic pursuits and essays. Um, and they tell us here to remember the following. These essays will appear in paper one under question six. So this means if you decide to specialize um, in your study, and you decide you want to study economic pursuits, then you must know that you're going to answer the essay question under question six only. So um, the first essay that they have here is discuss in detail export promotion as South Africa's international trade policy. And that was asked in the November 2023 question paper. And in the additional as well, I will not focus too much on the additional because, as I've mentioned before, it uh, does not stay the same. Um, however, you can use the additional to prepare for your uh, section B question. Um, then in November 2021, discuss the arguments in favor of protectionism. That is the integration of, then in the May, June 2022, Discuss in detail the demand side approach in promoting um, economic growth and development in South Africa. And then November 22, the RC to discuss in detail the South African growth and development policies um, and, um, and initiatives since 1994. And then in 2019, the R thing, the um, discuss in detail Africa's initiatives in regional development, and then June 2023, uh, which is the supplementary paper, uh, discuss in detail the various social indicators. So, as mentioned before, your introduction is the definition of um, the topic that you're going to discuss. Um, so here is a good example of a introduction. So um, we're going to discuss um, the detail. We're going to discuss the arguments in favor of protectionism. Therefore, you're going to give the definition of protectionism. And protectionism is a trade policy whereby a state 
um, implement measures to protect local industries against unfair competition uh, from abroad. So that is an accepted um, introduction. Then we get to our body or our main part, which is our 26 mark. Um, here, to tell us um, the first one is industrial development. And then you just give a brief um, explanation of it. So, yeah, they say some developing countries are well suited to establish certain kinds of industries. Uh, free trade would then hamper competition from developing countries. Um, and then protectionism will again prevent competition because um, it will be difficult to do away with once it is applied. So, that is under industrial development. Then infant industry. So this is, of course, your newly established industry. Um, they will suffer due to higher production costs compared to established um, established businesses from foreign from foreign competitors. Um, and then, of course, your stable wage levels and high standard of living, increased um, employment, economic self-sufficiency, and then uh, dumping as well. We discuss all of that there. Then your stabilizing um, exchange rates and balance of payments, and then lastly, protection of natural resources. So that is all that you're expected to discuss in your body. Then your conclusion must look something um, like this, that they gave us now suitable conclusion. Protectionism may offer short term benefits to domestic industry, and domestic means industries that is within that particular country, but its long term effects on global trade, economic growth, and consumer welfare uh, warrant careful consideration and evaluation. So that is a desired conclusion that we would have for an the question. Then the second essay was to discuss detail export promotion. So we are we're just going to elaborate what export promotion, sorry, promotion is in your introduction, and this involves providing incentives to encourage local businesses to produce for export. At the end of the day, so basically, um, we want our businesses that in our country to send the goods abroad and the main purpose of that is of course to earn foreign currency. So what are the methods that they could use and under your body? So incentives. So um Department of Trade and Industry can go and look for opportunities abroad so that um they can tell us what incentives there are once we export our locally produce products, other grants. So they, um, if a business produce, it might include tax concessions. So maybe instead of um, paying a tax rate of 28%, they might pay a reduced tax rate, which means that they will have more profits available at the end of the day. Subsidies. So subsidies will encourage exporters to increase the amount that they produce and then trade new uh, trade neutrality, uh, so um, subsidies um, equal in size to import duties are paid, and then they give us their reasons or advantages for export promotion, as well as the disadvantages, um, and then your conclusion. And uh, acceptable conclusion is export promotion policy fosters economic. Uh, growth by incentivizing businesses to expand internationally, enhancing competitiveness and global trade integration. So that is an accepted um, conclusion. So my advice is to please um, work through each particular essay, but of course you're going to do this in conjunction with your um, terminology as well. And like I've said previously, it is best to study topic by topic. And another word of advice before we move on to the next essay, your past papers, 
resources are also there. So you could also use that to determine how to answer your section B type question. In the third essay, um, the other want us to look at growth and development policies. Um, for now, there are two ways that you could introduce us, you could either provide us a definition of economic development, or you could provide us a definition of economic growth. So if you do economic development, you would say economic development is the process by which um, the standard of living improves over a period of time, or economic growth is an increase in the production capacity or real GDP of an economy over time. So that would be an acceptable um, introduction. Then moving on to your body. Now you are discussing the different um, strategic initiatives that the government has put into place. The first one would be the Reconstructive and Development Program, RTP. And please write out the words in full, um, like I mentioned before. Then the second one is your growth, employment, and redistribution method. Then it is your Black Economic Empowerment Program. Then you have your expanded public works program, accelerated and shared growth initiative for South Africa, and then your national skills development strategy, your joint initiative on priority skills acquisition, and then your small business uh, development promotion program, um, new growth or uh, your national development plan. So these are all the strategies that the government has put into place since 1994, and you are expected to elaborate on that. And of course, as I've mentioned before, if you the the facts mentioned here is a bit outdated, so you're most welcome to include current facts to your essay um, at the end of the day. Then an acceptable conclusion would be the modern economy has become more dynamic and it is important for the government to abort some policies that are no longer suitable and introduce um, new policies that are more relevant. So based on your discussion that you have in your body, this is um, an acceptable conclusion for this particular essay. Then, demand side, and uh, this one discussing in detail the demand side approach in promoting economic growth and development. So, introduction, you're discussing what is the demand side approach, and the demand side approach involves using discretionary changes in monetary and fiscal policy with the aim of changing the economic, changing the level of aggregate demand and therefore output at the end of the day. So in your main part, you are required to discuss the monetary policy. So you're going to tell us what is the monetary policy. Um, and its primary goal is, of course, to stabilize prices. Um, in terms of the inflation target, and then these are the instruments that they could use and that we've mentioned before in our term terminology, the interest rate change, and that is the most common one that they use lately, then open market transactions, so um, model suasion or persuasion, and cash reserve requirements, as well as exchange rate, uh, Policy. So those are the five that you could use under monetary um, policy. Then fiscal policy. We know that fiscal policy deals with um, government spending and taxation. And here, they so just look at the various tax systems that we have in place. So the progressive one that we currently use in our country. Remember, there are many other systems, but we use the progressive one. The more you earn, the more you'll get taxed in the wealth tax. So this is um, if you accumulate assets and you want to get rid of the assets, you the difference in the price that you bought it for and you sell it for, you'll be taxed on that. So if you bought a 
a car for 50,000 and sells for 60,000, you'll get tax on that 30,000 only. And this um, speaks to capital goods such as properties and shares as well. Then um, cash benefits, benefits in kind and other redistribution methods, land restitution and the land redistribution, very important. They might ask you the difference between the two. Um, they might even ask it in your um, one term. Um, yeah, so the restitution um, is returning the land and redistribution. Um, focuses on land for re residential or productive purposes. Property subsidies and then your conclusion. An acceptable conclusion for this particular essay deals with sustainable economic growth and development in a country is not a given unless the government applies strict and effective policies to manage the economy. Then the next one, uh, regional development. I discuss in detail the South Africa's initiatives in the regional development. So regional development, definition thereof in the introduction refers to policies which are aimed at increasing economic livelihood of a specific area or region. Then the first under your body, you have a special development initiative. Uh, you will elaborate on that and how that um, has an impact on your regional development. The second one would be your corridors. Then you'll have your industrial economic, uh, your industrial development zones, your special economic zones, and your conclusion. And your conclusion, every area in the country should be considered for, for development and growth and proper and effective policies and policy direction must be given on the entire development of the country. Then, um, discuss in detail the economic indicators. And um, as you know, we've got economic and social indicators and the only want you to focus on the economic indicators in this particular Essay. So government uses different uh, um, data to predict economic trends and formulate suitable developmental strategies towards influencing the direction that the economy should take. So that is the accepted introduction for this particular essay. Then under your body, they look at what um, indicators are important for the economy. So the first one, of course, would be inflation. Then you have your uh, producer, sorry, your production prices or PPI. Then you have your CPI, consumer price index, your foreign trade indicators, they look at terms of trade and exchange rate stability, your employment indicators, they look at your economically active population or your labor force, your employment rate and your unemployment rate. All your grade 10 work in this particular essay, then your two definition that you should know, the strict one and the expanded one. And then under your productivity indicators, we look at labor, productivity, remuneration per worker, interest, uh, under interest rates, and look at the repurchase rate, the money, money supply indicators, and then your conclusion. So the other say consistent analysis of composite indicators can provide both government and business. Businesses a clear sense of where the economy is going and how to plan for the future. So that would be an acceptable conclusion for this particular essay. Then the last essay, I think, um, would be your social indicator essay. So social indicators uh, a measure that economists or government use to evaluate the performance of a country in terms of the social well-being of its citizens. So if you have to compare the two, the one looks at economic things only, such as inflation um, and things that relate to the economics and social, this will look at the citizens only. 
the well-being of the citizens. But both is very important because the government needs to use that to plan effectively. So yeah, for your body, to look at the demographic, um, population growth, life expectancy, dependency rate, human development index, and then uh, nutrition, malnutrition, overweight or obesity, um, health, they look at infant child mortality, under five mortality, uh, depending on health, access to safe and cleaning, sorry, access to safe and clean drinking water, access to sanitation, education services, um, water supply, housing and urbanization, migration, um, those are the kind of things that they look at in this particular essay. Then a suitable conclusion would be here, the South African government annually increases its budget expenditure on health and education to improve the life of its citizens. So um, those are your essays for paper one. Um, so now we're moving back to our economic pursuit concepts. So I'll give you about five minutes to um, do one and do 13 and we'll compare our answers. And please be in mind, whatever we cannot finish today, uh, you're most welcome to work through it on your own and consult your teacher. And if your teacher needs any guidance, your teacher can contact the subject advisor uh, for that. So we will just do what we can during the session. And if our time runs out, then you um, please work through it on your own firstly, and then you consult your teacher as well. Right, we can compare our answers now. For number one, um, trade policy that discourages imports to guard domestic industries from harmful um, foreign competition and uh, protectionism. That is our um, answer there. Number two, um, the movement of imports and exports between countries without um, any restrictions, and that is known as free trade. Thank you, Bao. Number four, I see we, we're skipping lots of numbers today. I do apologize. Number four, um, the removal of unnecessary regulations that inhibit uh, the free operations of markets, and that is deregulation. Number five, thank you, Tawa. Uh, Uh, the register will be posted uh, soon for the school. Um, then the free trade, number five, the free, sorry, the trade policy way, whereby the country encourages the local production of goods and service, of goods rather than importing of goods, and that is known as import substitution. Number five. Number seven, the provision of incentives to encourage local businesses to produce goods to sell to other countries, and that is export promotion. Number eight, a trade policy whereby the government uses incentives and subsidies to encourage uh, businesses to encourage South African businesses to sell to other countries. So number seven and number eight is exactly the same, which is export promotion. Then number eight, a tariff imposed as a percentage of um, the value of goods imported. Uh, 
um, and that is at polar polar uh, terra. That one it comes from Leighton. Um, then number ten, a tariff based on a fixed amount per unit weight or size that is levied on import um, imported goods, and that is a specific tariff. Tariff number ten, specific tariff number eleven. Um, when a product is sold on a foreign market at a price lower than the cost of production in the country of origin, and that is known as dumping. Um, number 12, a penalty imposed by one or more countries on another country by restricting trade, and that is known as a sanction. Number 13, an organization that promotes free trade amongst Argentina, Brazil, uh, Paraguay, and Uruguay, um, that is known as the um, Mercos. And then number 14, a group a group of emerging economies consisting of Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, set up to promote cooperation, policy coordination, and promote political dialogue in international um, economic and financial matter, and that is known as BRICS. Uh, thank you. An official state ban on trade or other activities was put with a particular country, and that is an embargo. Then number 16 provides, um, provides for regional cooperation and integration among African states, and that is known as your new Partnership for African Development, or alternatively known as New Pad. Number 17, established to promote regional, regional cooperation and integration, focusing on economic development, peace, and security in the region. Um, that is known as your Southern African Development Community. Um, SEDEC. The number 18 member, members comprising Angola, Botswana, the Democratic, the Democratic Republic of Cong Congo, Lesotho, Malawi, Mauritius, Mozambique, um, Namibia, Seychelles, South Africa, Tanzania, Zambia, Zimbabwe. Cormos and Isuatini and Madagascar. That is also FedEx, South African Development Community. The number 19 promotes um, promotes development in the Southern African region by financing important develop, development projects. And that is your development, developmental bank of Southern Africa. Developmental bank of Southern Africa. Then number 20 refers to the process of reducing or eliminating barriers to international trade. And that is trade liberalization. Number 21, the international organization that was created to monitor and liberalize international trade, and that is known as your World Trade Organization. Then, number 22, an international 
organization that facilitates global trade, also World Trade Organization, an agreement upon rules, procedures, or behavior that govern activities in any group or organization um, that is known as your protocol. Then, number 26, the restriction on the quantity of imports allowed into a country, and that is known as an import quota. Then the decrease in production costs due to high uh, levels of production that we call economies of scale. And in the last one, the cooperation between countries to adopt a common monetary and fiscal policy that is known as economic union. So that is the first um, topic under economic pursuits. Now we're going to move on to the next one, and I think this will be the last one due to time constraints. So I'll give you about three minutes to do one and do 14 quickly, and then we'll compare our answers. And then while the learners are completing the answers, the register has just been posted in the chat, so please um, ensure that it, that you fill out the registers, um, educators. Thank you. Right, so number one, under the subtopic economic growth and development, increase in the productive capacity of a country over a given, sorry, over a a period of time, and that is known as your economic growth, increase in production capacity, that's your keywords. Then, number four, the increase in the standard of living of people over a period of time, and that is your economic development. Then, number five, a policy that aims to increase the annual production or income in the economy, and that is known as your economic growth policy. Number six, a policy that involves the interaction of economic, social, and human development is known as your economic development policy. Number seven, return land to those who have lost it due to discriminatory laws of the past. And then number eight, the compensation of citizens who lost land as a result of discriminatory apartheid practices. So number seven and eight sounds familiar, but they're not. Number seven deals with uh, land redistribution and the number eight is land restitution. Number seven is land redistribution and number eight is land restitution. Number nine, worldwide interaction of economies with trade as an important element and most people um, would classify this as international trade or free trade, but it is not that, it is globalization. Uh, because of the worldwide. That is what makes the concept known as globalization because of worldwide in the description. Then expressed by the real a GDP per capita and per capita is per person, life expectancy and level of literacy and that is classified as your standard of living. Then Number 11, the act that promotes redress and transformation in the workplace in terms of race, gender, and disabilities, and that is known as your employment equity.
Then number 12, uh, the focus is on attempts to increase aggregate demand in an economy by using fiscal and monetary policy. So that would be your um, demand side approach. Number 14. Uh, policies aimed at increasing the production capacity of an economy. And that is your supply side approach. Um, then number 15. The government policy focuses on the acquisition or acquisition of skills. And that is known as your joint initiative on priority skills acquisition, known as JIPSA. Um, and then number 16, an initiative. An initiative um, that helps identify and develop skills that are urgently needed to promote job creation. But the same as number 15, which is um, Joint Initiative on Priority Skills Acquisition, known as GIPSA. Then, for the final um, final uh, few terms before our time expires, uh, number 17, and government program to produce a Sorry, to promote economic growth and development through infrastructure development, skills development, and investment promotion. That is known as AHISA, or the proper word would be um, Accelerated Shared Growth Initiative. Number 18, the growth and development policy that aims to eliminate and reduce poverty reduce inequalities by 2030, so that should be 2030 and not 203, and that is your um, National Development Plan. Number 19, the government's intervention program aimed at creating employment by using labor intensive methods, and that is known as your expanded public works program. Number uh, 20, uh, initiatives to stimulate economic growth and development, national growth force. And then lastly, uh, number 21, that is where I will end for today. Um, a policy framework that wants to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality by 2030, and that is a national growth plan. Just take note there by 18 and 21. It sounds the same, but it's not the same. The one, um, so one is a national development plan and the other one is national growth plan. So what I want to emphasize is some of the terminologies might look the same, in the, in the paper, but it is actually not. Therefore, we encourage you to work through all of that. Then in this booklet, you also have, that was paper one that we focus on mostly, but here's also paper two as well. And under paper two, here you also have your past essays that um, have been identified for you, um, as well as um, worked out for you because I knew that time will be a factor in the session. So how to answer it as well. Um, yeah, so um, and then here's more terminologies that you can practice in your free time in the preparation for the upcoming um, National Senior Certificate. So um, 
the sister before I um say my goodbyes and we purchase um tell you the focus of the both papers. So paper two deals with macroeconomics and contemporary economic issues. So if you're going to do um contemporary economic issues and you're gonna answer question three and four in section B and question six in section C. If you're going to do macroeconomics, you're gonna answer question two and question four in section B and question five in section C. So um please make use of the resources that um you have to your disposal. Um grade twelves, we wish you all the best for the upcoming control test. Also, control this for the National Senior Certificate. I do apologize. Uh, National Senior Certificate. Please make use of the resources. Please ask your teacher for uh, um, guidance if you're stuck with something. And uh, we wish you all the best for the upcoming paper one and two. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day further. <laughs>